Hey there, good people in crypto land. I'm Matt Lysing, and this is my podcast, Decent People. Welcome back to the conversation. Took a couple of weeks off just to recharge the batteries, but I'm excited to be back. And I've got a great guest today. His name is Pat McCarty, and he has been all over Washington, D.C. during his career. He has served on the staff of the U.S. House Committee on Banking. He was representing uh, big buy-side investment firms as the general counsel of the Managed Funds Association. He was at the CFTC as their general counsel and was senior counsel at the SEC during the financial crisis. After that, he went to work at the Senate Ag Committee, where he helped draft parts of the Dodd-Frank bill. He then went on to the private sector, where he was director of government relations at ICAP, which at that time was a huge dealer. It was a broker between banks and all sorts of markets like swaps and energy and all sorts of things. Pat has also taught classes at Catholic University and Georgetown and has recently founded McCarty Financial, which is an advisory firm. So Pat is just a wealth of knowledge on all things Washington and regulation and how the Hill works. And we got into all of that in relation to crypto and the stablecoin bills that are going through and a bill that Pat helped write that lays out a definition of digital assets as being either a digital asset security or a digital asset commodity. We talk about NFTs and how Pat views them as collectibles rather than as a security. And we talk about what's going on in the U.S. right now with regulation and how uh, there are some dark clouds that are definitely gathering over the U.S. and how we're seeing businesses talk about going overseas and leaving the U.S. entirely because of the very difficult regulatory environment. So with all that being said, let's get to the conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks a lot for listening. Hey, Pat, how are you doing? I'm great, Matt. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's great to see you. And I was really hoping to see you in a bow tie today, but you're at your house and you've got a nice striped polo on, so I'll accept that. But I think you have made quite a name for yourself in the bow tie over the years. Well, it's nice of you to say that, especially with respect to the bow tie. <laughs> so you and I have known each other for a long time. We got to know each other when you were general, you know, your legislative affairs at ICAP, which is a big derivative trading organization. But before that, you had spent many years both on the congressional side of things and then on the regulatory side of things in Washington. So I'd love to get into that with you in a bit. But first of all, I'd just love to start off with your background and where you're coming from. So where'd you grow up? I grew up here in Alexandria, Virginia. I live in the house I grew up in. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Wow. More is that weird? Pardon me? Is that weird? No, actually, I like it. You it's, don't still have uh, your old room, do you? No. I, I, <laughs> Good. You upgraded? My, my wife and I took over the main bedroom as opposed to the little kid's bedroom. So that's the way we did it. Okay. Good. Glad to hear that. And yeah, so you raised your own your kids in the house where you grew up as well. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. That's cool. So the people in the neighborhood, they say, oh, that's the old McCarty place. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. It's funny. My career, I've spent, it was weird for about maybe 20 years. I held maybe four or five different positions in DC at different agencies, but I was within maybe a stone's throw of each building. I worked for the bank board. I worked for the OTS. I worked for the RTC and then worked for the FDIC and if DC, that's, they're all within three blocks of each other. Uh -huh. So it was, I knew the way it's just which parking garage did I pull into? <laughs> yeah. I bet that could get con yeah, confusing over the years. Were your parents in like official DC in that realm or what were they doing? My, my dad was a, a lawyer and my mother was a homemaker and just administrative law grew up. It was funny because I have two brothers and we all three became lawyers. So there seems to be some type of you know, birth defect that causes McCarty's to become lawyers. But yeah. that's my dad kind of liked it. I thought it was neat that we all followed and became lawyers. So good stuff. Yeah. And you've, so you've been in that area for a long time. How has DC changed over all those decades? Is it much different? I'm assuming it's a lot different than when you were growing up. One, the one thing that's really phenomenal is the amount of security now about basically 
driving downtown and getting into federal agencies. I can remember back when President Reagan was in and they were talking about Libyan hit squads. And that led to closing off part of Pennsylvania Avenue that goes in front of the White House. And that was going to be temporary, but it's actually grown in terms of the White House complex has become very, let's say, fortified and difficult to get into. And I think you see this when you go into the SEC and other government agencies now. There's a whole security kind of you know situation going on. And it's a little bit like TSA land when you're taking flights. You have to go through, be announced. You have to be checked for this, that, and the other thing. There's an awful lot of security in D.C., And it seems like the agencies have grown significantly in size. That's just perception. Maybe it hasn't grown all that much, but... Yeah, that's um, interesting. Because I remember even after September 11th, going to the CFTC for meetings, like you just walked in there. It was no big deal. So it sounds like that's a definite change from just even then. So did you... Did a young Pat McCarty see himself becoming a lawyer? Or were you like always wanting to follow in your dad's footsteps? Or what were you thinking of doing back in those days? The positions of like quarterback on the Redskins was already taken. So it seemed a law- being a lawyer was a good idea. I was an economics major at UVA. And if I was going to become an economist, that meant that I had to be a lot better at math. So the law seemed to present a better option. So that, it, and it's, you can do an awful lot of things when you're a lawyer. It doesn't really, you're not fitting into one particular item or another. It's just good training. It's been very a lot of fun. I've gotten to do a lot of different things. So it's been an enjoyable career. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of that career, you one of your first major jobs was with the U, U.S. House Committee on Banking. So how did you land there and what were you doing back in those days? What was the sort of discussion about? I had spent some time, I actually was a banking regulator for 10 years. I had started off over at the, the Federal Home Loan Bank Board that then was turned into the Office of Tr- Thrift Supervision after FIREA was passed in the, I guess, late, I guess, 1989. And then I went off to work at the RTC and ended up down at the FDIC after the RTC was closed down and just happened to run into a friend at a birthday party who said that they were looking for a banking council because her boss was the chairman of the Financial Institutions Subcommittee of House Banking. She asked me if I knew anybody who'd be interested. And I said, yeah, I got at least one name for you. And she said, who? I said, me. And she said, great. Let's work out some kind of a deal. So You pulled a Dick Cheney before Dick Cheney pulled a Dick Cheney. Do you remember when... He was put in charge of Bush's VP search. <laughs> Pardon me? The, Dick Cheney was put in charge of George W. Bush's search for a vice presidential candidate. And he said, no, it's me. So <laughs> he pulled <laughs> Cheney years before Cheney did that. Yeah. I think the thing is that I had been working at the FDIC and the RTC for eight years, something like that. And the opportunity to work on the Hill sounded like a neat thing to do. So I just said, let's give that a shot. I got detailed from the FDIC up to the House Banking Committee in, I guess, 1997. And I worked up there for two and a half to three years and was there for the passage of Graham Leach Bliley, you know, which okay. got rid of the last vestiges of the Glass-Steagall. It was very and interesting. Yet, so explain that for listeners who might not know. What's the importance of Glass-Steagall? Glass-Steagall was the, I guess, 1920s legislation which separated commercial banking from investment banking and kind of made it so that the commercial banking, retail banking world was not involved with the security side of things. And as we've seen over the succeeding decades and looking at the universal bank structure that they have in Europe, there were these banks that were combining both investment banking and commercial banking and insurance together. And there was this hue and cry here in the United States by the large banks to say, listen, we think we should be able to do the same things that the Europeans can do and the Asians. And so that led to financial modernization, which was ended up being called when it was passed, I guess, in late 1998, early 1999, the Glass-Steagall Act. Pardon me. 
the Graham Leach Bliley Act after Senator Phil Graham, Jim Leach, the chairman of the House Banking Committee, and Representative Bliley, who was the chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Okay. So I got to work on that. I was on the Marge Rockman's Council on the Financial Institutions Subcommittee and was there for two and a half to three years. And that was right there at the end when it was passed in the law. And am I wrong? Didn't that bill also contain a provision about the over-the-counter swaps market that let it continue to be unregulated? Yeah, it did. In fact, actually, it was cementing the agreement that you had by the Fed with the OCC and the SEC that the CFTC should not be regulating swaps. The SEC had their hands tied somewhat, although they retained fraud authority and manipulation authority. But it was a, yeah, that, but that was a minor part of Graham Leach Pliley as opposed to being the the major focus. The no, I only bring it up of, because I remember after the financial crisis, people pointed back to that and said, look, if the CFTC had been given authority over this 10 years prior, the financial crisis probably would have been much different because the swaps market would have most likely had some form of regulation. Yeah, I, th I think you're right about that. And it's one of those things, a missed opportunity. But at the moment, there was this, the modernization theme was being pushed strong by the commercial banks. And obviously, the largest commercial banks were also active in the swaps market. So they were yeah. looking for legal certainty. Uh, and that legal certainty would be that, in fact, those products would not be subject to regulation by the CFTC or the SEC for the most part. Yeah. And then so Glass-Steagall coming down, that allowed banking to just get much, much bigger and led to the modern Wall Street that was booming in the early 2000s. So what's that? What, take us behind the curtain a little bit. And what's that like to be involved in writing legislation? What was your job and how does that, how's the sausage made? Let's put it this way. It's very interesting to watch people talk about the sausage making activity when you're doing legislation. That's absolutely true. There's a lot of horse trading going on. Some You need votes to get things done. And sometimes you have to give somebody something that they want badly to get their vote, even if, in fact, you don't think that it's the right thing to do. That being said, I was not like a primary drafter of a lot of the statutory stuff that was in there. In fact, actually, Lori Schaefer, who's, I guess, now the general counsel of the Treasury Department, was really one of the primary driving forces in terms of drafting the legislation, for which became Graham Leach Bliley. In fact, she was, a, I believe, a Fed lawyer previously, and she actually had a very Fed-centric point of view on things in terms of banking regulation being better than the market regulators, the CFTC and the SEC. And that, that led to some of the skewing of how that bill ended up. It called for functional regulation and repealed the exemption for banks to be considered to be broker-dealers that had to register with the SEC. But it, if you take a look at the 34 Act today and you look at the definition of broker, the carve-out for banks is very significant, even though the total exclusion from the definition of broker was eliminated, they still got to retain or grandfathered in most of their historic activities in a lot of different areas like custody and certain types of trading activity that they involved in. So it's an interesting thing to watch. And everybody should see something about that because it's not it's the art of the possible, not the perfect. It's very rare that good policy and good politics line up. And you have to take the good with the bad. Most of the time, people think that if you get, if 80% of the bill is what you wanted, then that was a good deal. Yeah. I think that's where it was. Very interesting. Very eye-opening. Yeah. And I, for me. I think it's another point you raise. Is I think not something a lot of people know is how much staffers are involved in writing legislation. That's really their job. It's not, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not like Phil Graham sitting down with a pen and paper and writing the bill. <laughs> It's his staff or her, whoever staff we're talking about, which is a little bit more of behind the scenes sort of thing. So let me just jump ahead a little bit here. You soon after, not soon, but 
further on in your career, you became the general counsel at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which you've mentioned, the CFTC. That's the main derivatives regulator in the United States, come on, related to energy or agriculture, or what have you, financial products now, like euro dollars and treasury bills. Was that, so going from a staffer on the Hill to being at the higher levels of, of a regulatory agency, how does that transition for you? And what were you guys doing at the CFTC at that point? Interestingly, between the House Banking Committee and the CFTC, I actually spent a year and a half over at the Managed Funds Association being their general counsel mm -hmm. and executive vice president for Congressional Affairs. So I was- And that's um, just so people know that is a group that is, it's a lobbyist group for like hedge funds and managed yep. funds and asset managers, basically. So they're getting yeah. their views a point, views across to various people on the Hill. Yeah. And so that was an interesting point to be with them. And I got to know some of the people over at the CFTC and was talking to them about some of the issues that we had and as a, as the MFA and was having lunch with the chief of staff for the chairman. And he says, Hey, we need a general counsel and we'd love to have you come in hmm. and do that. I said, cool. that's really interesting. I'm not an expert on the Commodity Exchange Act. Let me think about it. And it turned out there was a, uh, it was too good of an opportunity. I was like, yeah, I'm not going to get offered the general counsel position of a major federal agency at some point in time very often. So you have to take those opportunities when they come along. So I said, yeah. And so I became general counsel at the CFTC in 2002 in the spring. And it was great. I'd actually had a little experience with the Commodity Exchange Act when I was over at the FDIC. And it was a it was interesting because the discussion inside the FDIC general counsel's office was, does anybody know about the Commodity Exchange Act? And <laughs> we need to get smart on this. Does anybody want to take that on? And I remember talking to David Wall about that. And I was like, let me take a look at it and tell you what I think. I think I'm pretty, I was a securities lawyer right out of, out of law school. And so I thought that I knew how different can the Commodity Exchange Act be. And I came back to him and said, this is pretty difficult and we'll have to look at it. But I, it's not the same thing that I thought in terms of the way that you see the federal securities law. So it was an interesting dynamic, but I was really had a good time at the CFTC. I was there for four years. Do you and think that's because the, that difference is because it's going back to the 1800s, starting with like farmers and how they were able to hedge their crops and things like that? And it was that, or were they just taking a fundamentally different approach than something that's a security and sort of a little more abstract rather than a well, bushel of corn? It's interesting because the commodities world, we've been regulating commodities at the federal level, at least the futures contracts on commodities, since 1921. And so the, the first federal securities laws was passed in 1933. So a dozen years before the 33 Act was passed, there was federal legislation on futures contracts on commodities. So I think it's interesting because the commodity exchanges have been around since the 1850s. Yeah. People have been trading futures contracts since 1300s, 1400s, and things like that. So it's a long the derivative side of the equation in the commodity space has been around a very long time, but it is a very different way of looking at things. And there's a lot of inside baseball about regulating the derivative of a commodity as opposed to regulating the actual spot or cash commodities. And that's that was always one of these interesting dynamics about you don't have really jurisdiction over the cash side of things. And that's what's going on right now with the digital asset world. Yeah, that's what brought it to mind is that there's still this debate about the SEC versus the CFTC and who's got the proper jurisdiction here for something like crypto. And it, this debate has been going on forever on all sorts of things. And it's always a bit of a turf war. So I guess that's what sort of I just put that thought in my head. Now, Matt, just to be honest about it, I love this saying that I've seen from some financial services lawyers who basically talk about the SEC and securities. They say, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. 
I think that's exactly where the SEC is, is that every financial instrument they've ever seen is a security. And that flows through with respect to not only digital assets or cryptocurrencies, whatever you want to call them, but also stable coins. I remember that Gary Gensler referenced the fact that stable coins look an awful lot like money market mutual funds, and we could regulate those. And yeah. I pointed out to people that because I was a 40 act lawyer before I became a banking lawyer. So there's one big difference between money market mutual funds and stable coins. And the answer is basically that there's no yield to owning a stable coin. If you buy a tether, US dollar right. tether, Right. It should be always at $1. You don't get any interest or dividends. You return the tether and they give you back a dollar. So okay. it fails the Howey test, pr prong three, because there's no reasonable expectation of profit. That's a great point. And yeah. so from the point of view, interestingly, just backing up on my banking and securities law background, the banking industry yelled and screamed back in the late 70s when the securities industry started talking about having money market funds. They argued that money market funds were actually just deposits. Hmm. And end up that the Department of Justice disagreed with them on that and said basically, look, this is wrong because money market fund is actually you get an equity interest in the company, the money market fund itself. And you have a right to some of the underlying assets and you're being paid profits. Not, it's not like a debt instrument or pardon me, a liability, like a deposit. Yeah. So an interesting dynamic there, but everything goes around, which comes around on this kind of stuff. Yeah. And then just to add to your previous point, the fact that there have been derivative products built on top of cryptocurrencies, like in the US for Bitcoin futures, Ether futures, there's been, I don't know how many billions of dollars have traded in those, and those are all regulated by the CFTC. So it's definitely not- Did you say billions all. or trillions? I, is, it, has it, is it trillions? Yeah, trillions have been traded yeah. on Bitcoin futures. Yeah. Not, you can exclude the problem, maybe the swaps, side of that if you wanted to, but trillions of dollars in Bitcoin futures have been traded. Yeah. And that's without incident in the, on CME since December of 2017. Yep. And that's five squarely years in ago, the, six years the ago. CFTC's wheelhouse. That's the regulated CFTC products. And it, yeah, it, so, and it doesn't appear like there's been that much of a problem with those particular products, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Yeah. And I think that speaks to the strength of the CME as an institution that's been trading for a long time and all sorts of products and also just the well-established and well-understood framework for that type of future. And he, it's interesting, like the market wanted, I kept hearing for years that people wanted a deliverable futures product for Bitcoin so that if you held it to expiry, you would actually receive Bitcoin. Yeah. The CME does it differently. They pay you the difference in the cash for, for where the price is and where the contract was settling. And then, so ICE comes out, right, with its deliverable product under backed, and I, I don't believe that ever went anywhere. I think there were a lot of more, a lot of issues about delivery and the custody and things like that that were complicated. But anyway, yeah, it's just, it's a, I think it's a sign that there's a robust market there and people are, exchanges are able to compete with offering different types of contracts with different features for people who want different outcomes. It's interesting you mentioned that in CME because... I think some people are ignoring the fact that the CME is listed and traded tens of billions of dollars in Ether futures as well. Yeah. And again, just like with the Bitcoin futures, doesn't appear like there's been that much of a market problem. And I would note that the SEC finally approved a Bitcoin futures ETF without doing a spot Bitcoin. ETF. And I think that was because the view that the CFTC is a market regulator and CME is adequately regulated, and we think that they're actually doing a good job. Yeah. And I why not add, with respect to Ether? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I would add to that that I think they probably feel a lot more comfortable with the regulatory framework that's around the CME and with the CFTC rather than with the spot market where it's just cash and who knows what could go on there and the manipulation that could take place. But so let's just like quickly, you then from the CFTC, you went to, you were a senior counsel at the SEC. So the other side of this debate, you were there during the financial crisis. I'm curious, what was that like being inside the SEC when it seemed like the global economy was <laughs> teetering on the edge. <laughs> Things weren't good at that point in time. No, I went in and I was actually working in a special group, very small, three people who were meant to support the chairman of the SEC on two different oversight boards, one for the, I guess, the Financial Stability Oversight Board, and then the one that was actually supposed to be watching or wondering how things were going with the, the conservatorships for Fannie and Freddie and keeping an eye on what's going on with the federal home loan bank system as well. So that was, it was a very specialized area that I was in. So we were helping monitor a lot of those things and basically preparing briefing materials and questions for the chairman. I was only there for a year. It, I wanted to actually help work on the what became Dodd-Frank. And I was at, talked to several people about getting a bigger role on that. And they were like, oh, we've got plenty of people to work on the legislation, but we need people to do the stuff that you're doing. And I was like, interesting. And then I was a, actually got offered a job to work on Senate Ag. And, and Robert Holyfield, who was the chief of staff for Blanche Lincoln, who was the chairman of the committee, asked me if I wanted to come on and help work on the legislation. And I said, absolutely. So I quit the SEC and went to work for the Senate Ag Committee. Yeah, and you helped write a good portion of Title Seven of Dodd- Dodd-Frank. That was the title that reformed the, the OTC swaps market that we were discussed, mentioned earlier. Yeah, you know, it's funny because when I got up there, the House had just passed their version of Dodd-Frank and it came over to the Senate, and the Senate Banking Committee was just banging away on trying to get things done. And there was a very problematic thing in terms of the Republicans and the Democrats on the Senate Banking Committee. They weren't making much progress. And then the Senate Ag Committee was told, okay, if you're going to do something in the swap space, you better do that. And so we got started and worked with Saxby Chambliss, his staff people. And we came up with what we thought was a pretty good product and did a markup. We got a bipartisan vote to report our bill out, which in fact covered more than just Title VII, but we made significant changes to what the House had passed on swaps. And we think we did a a nice job on that, and we were able to get a bipartisan vote, which was quite reassuring and it moved forward. So we were very happy about that. And that we set up pretty much what we passed out of Senate Ag and was the base text for the conference and actually became, I'd say 95% of what was there was what was finally enacted. Yeah. And that, yeah, that's amazing because that was coming out of the financial crisis and was the response to the swaps market was definitely a part of the crisis. It wasn't the cause of it, but it made it much worse, I think, and added fuel to the fire is how I like to describe it. And then, so that then all went through a huge process after Congress passed it with the CFTC and everything that had to actually enact, the leg- turn the legislation into practical market rules. But also at this time, Bitcoin had kind of come out. It was gaining public consciousness. Do you remember when you first came across it? <sighs> had to be like 2015. The Bitcoin white paper was put out by Satoshi Nakamoto, Halloween, October 31st, 2008. I don't think anybody was aware of it during the course of the Dodd-Frank Act discussions, but it started to get some traction. I remember back in 2013, 2014, and I became very interested in it because I was teaching class on derivatives up at Catholic U Law School and thought that this was a very interesting place. Chairman Tim Massad in December of 2014 testified before Senate Ag and said, Bitcoin and 
many other digital assets are actually commodities under the Commodity Exchange Act. Hmm. And this was three years before the SEC issued their Dow token report. Um, it's an interesting dynamic because the CFTC then took some enforcement actions in 2015 and 2016 involving Bitcoin trading. Hmm. And they asserted that Bitcoin and other digital assets are commodities under the Commodity Exchange Act. If you were trading some kind of derivative, like a swap or an option or something like that, it came within their jurisdiction. And yeah. it's just a phenomenal thing. I was looking at that and I said, this is really interesting. And I decided that I wanted to basically teach a class on it. So I talked to Professor Chris Brummer at Georgetown University Law Center in, I guess, early 2017. I said, we should teach a class on this together. He said, that's a great idea. I said, why don't you write a syllabus and then we'll talk about it? I said, you're on. So we actually team taught in the fall of 2018, our first digital asset seminar. And it was great. It was a lot of fun and I've done it every year since over at Georgetown and I've actually taught it as well in the spring semester over at Catholic for the last two years. And what do you tell your students in terms of this, this is a digital asset and it has these components of the traditional financial world that you probably already are familiar with, but it's also, what, and then what's new about it? Like, how do you, what's the mix that you try to convey to folks about the innovation, but then rests on the shoulders of other things that have come before? So, you know, I'm a big fan of the technology as opposed to the currencies. There's roughly 23,600 different tokens in existence today, according to coin market cap. And it's more the blockchain technology, and I'm not going to basically parse that it's proof of work or proof of stake. I think the idea that you've got some kind of ledger that is, and you're crypto, using cryptography to basically ensure that there's no funny business is, could be revolutionary. It's a great idea. It could actually really revolutionize the financial services sector just by basically making things easier and less friction in doing transactions. It should lower costs dramatically. That's one of the reasons why DeFi looks very interesting. And that was what the basis of the Bitcoin white paper was. It was intended to be a peer-to-peer -peer currency. You, had to, yeah. you eliminated the banks from the cash, right? Yeah. <clears throat> It's very, I mean, there could be lots of really fundamental changes and break down cost and cut out middlemen in the financial services sector. If you, if this grows and becomes accepted and they work out all of the kinks that are there, it's not perfect, but it's got a lot of promise. So I think it's a really very interesting area. I'm very pro what the technology is and that things can actually be, could transform our society. What what do you think needs to happen? Because it has been several years now, at least six years on from 2017. What, in your opinion, needs to get better and needs to or be created so that sort of transformation can take place? One of the first things that you have to do is if you've got problems, you have to admit that you've got them and then have to try to fix them. The problem with fraud, the problem with hacks, the problem with not wanting to be subject to regulation are all major issues that the industry needs to come to grips with. And quite frankly, I tell people legal certainty is the most important issue that you've got here. Okay. These, if there's 23,600 and some odd tokens out there, people are going to ask the question, so what are they? Well, if we talk to Gary Gensler, he would say Bitcoin is a commodity and everything else is probably a security. I don't think that's the case, but what you need to do is have some type of dividing line, jurisdictional line drawn, which says these particular digital assets are viewed as being securities, and these digital assets are viewed as being commodities, and that's what should be done. People have you know, Do you think we have that in the current legal or current body of law, like the Howey test, or is there a need for Congress to address this with some new legislation that sort of hammers out what you're just saying there, like how do you separate a security from a commodity? No, I don't think we have that at all today. Quite frankly, I think it's the naivete of 
some of the people who talk about, like, we're just going to codify the Howey test. If you listen to Gary Gensler in front of the House Financial Services Committee the other day, he said, the law is perfectly clear. And he said, we don't need legislation. We've got all the legislation we need. And it's because he says, these things are investment contracts and they meet the Howey test and everything but Bitcoin is a security. So if you codified the Howey test, just to make things very clear, Matt, if you codified the Howey test, according to Gary Gensler, it would mean that everything other than Bitcoin is a security. That would not be a good result, I would yeah. believe. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. And there's this industry is not stopping its innovation. There's now something called an XNFT, which is an NFT that has, it holds executable code within it. So it, th th these kinds of things, I don't even, I'm still trying to wrap my head around that and where that would fit into this framework. And it's also the fact that the, there have been quite a few times when the SEC, like you mentioned, the Dow report has basically said Ether is not a security. And then Gensler, I think, is trying to backtrack on that as much as he can. It's troubling. Let me, let me go to this. First of all, I've helped draft a, the, I, helped draft the first comprehensive legislative proposal introduced in the Congress on digital assets. And that was the bill that Representative Don Beyer introduced in July of 2021, the Digital Asset Market Structure and Investor Protection Act, H.R. 4741. And that bill has a digital asset security definition, and it varies widely from what's in the Howey test. And it's intended to basically restrict to a certain extent and make clearer which digital assets are securities and which ones are, if you're not a digital asset security, then you would be viewed as being a digital asset commodity. Now, yeah. I actually quite frankly agree with what the IRS and Treasury have recently put out, which is that most NFTs should be viewed as being collectibles, a little bit like art or statues or videos or other things like that. They're not securities and they're not commodities if they're not fungible with other things. So that's my view, although there is an exception to all that. If you fractionalize ownership of art, then it's usually viewed as an investment contract under the Howey test. So I would say that if you're fractionalizing NFTs, which has been done quite a bit, then those are probably going to be viewed as being securities as well. But well, I do you believe bring that, that it's... Because I, wasn't that where Howie came from? It was a an, he, somebody in Florida owned orange groves and he tried to fractionalize them and sell them and then, but got in trouble with the SEC and it went through the court system and the courts eventually said, no, that you, by fractionalizing this orchard and trying to sell it to investors for a profit, you create, you turned that piece of land into a security. Well, I think the defining factor in the Howey test or situation was the fact that people were buying pieces of the orange grove, but they were also ha required to enter into a service contract with the orchard. And the service contract required was basically, we're going to basically take care of the orchard for you and we will pay you a, you give a certain amount of money and we, ra we will give you dividends or interest. The service contract was the sort of the addition to the real estate interest that turned it into an investment contract. Because it was like, you're not going to make any money unless somebody's harvesting the oranges and selling them. So the service contract part of it is a significant part of the Howey test, which kind of gets lost in the a lot of the debate that's going on here, I, I think it's one of these things where there's it's important to say that some of these things, they're commodities. Remember, frozen orange juice from the Trading Places movie is a commodity. We all know that. But mm -hmm. the fact is, is that you had in that situation, you were buying some real estate, but you were required to enter into a servicing contract to basically make sure that the Oranges could be harvested, and in fact, you got a, a little piece of return on that because of what had to go in and to make the profit. So it was is there an analog? 
Is there an analog, in your opinion, to that servicing contract today in crypto? Because I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. It doesn't seem to quite jibe with what's going on now. Yeah, then let's put it this way. There's, there's a b- bunch of other kind of items. The Howey test is four parts. Investment of money in a common enterprise, reasonable expectation of profit through the significant managerial efforts of others. If somebody tells you that they're going to build out the ecosystem, we're going to continue to code, we're going to continue to market, we're going to continue to do this, that, and the other thing to build this out. And we think that the the token that you've got is going to be used, is going to be the currency for this particular platform. There are going to be all this, the demand is going to be huge. Then you've got the additional service activity that was part of the service contract. You can't run an orchard without having the farmers and the people coming through and picking the oranges and then crating them up and sending them off to the market. Here, with respect to crypto, you've got people who are coding up a storm, who are building out the API for this and the platform and what's going on. So there is that people who are doing significant things and they're telling you that, in fact, you're going to make a a min of money. And I think that's... Let's put it this way, Matt. Let's go back to Dodd-Frank, okay? Mm -hmm. Some of these 23,600 tokens are securities, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. And some of them, which would be Bitcoin, Ether, and a bunch of other things, are digital asset commodities. And what Congress needs to do is establish clear definitions on what a digital asset security is, and it shouldn't be the codification of the Howey test. And they should basically say, these things right here are securities and the SECs. These things over here are digital asset commodities. They're not securities, and they're under the CFTC. That's what you need to do. And nobody seems to have the the vision or the ability to basically get that done yet. Do you think there's a third option where people say this shouldn't exist at all and that we should try to put the genie back in the bottle here? It seems... No. It, I, don't, I think it's unrealistic because look what Europe has done with MICA. And MICA? I think you've got in South America, you've got the same things. This is not something... We're not good in the United States at basically saying to people, you can't do this at all. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're receptive to stablecoin legislation versus what the Chinese have done is that's just not our, we usually don't prohibit things. And because once people have started doing stuff in this space, it may be that there are certain benefits that we weren't aware of. So it's an interesting dynamic there. Yeah. Yeah, I hear that. It's just, it seems like there is a bit of a push to regulate some of this out of existence, or at least to get it out of the United States at this point. I would agree with you on that. And in fact, um, my view of this is that The industry, 12 months ago, the industry was not under attack by all of the federal agencies and by the White House. Today is different. They were taking money from the industry. Things are very bad right now for the digital asset world. It's just a fact. It seems like there's a drumbeat of negativity here. Now, the thing is, they could help themselves a lot. Telling people that you need legal clarity or legal certainty runs a little thin when, in fact, people are trying to do something legislatively. But it seems like every time you get closer, they say, well, that that's too prescriptive, which is just BS. It's, you guys don't want to be regulated, or you don't want to be nearly as regulated as people who are in the financial services industry today. I get that, but the point would be, like, we'd like to bring you into the industry and you're going to have to put up with a certain amount of regulation. And they just don't seem able to be, say yes. I think there's also been a severe lack of trust with the way that, for example, the SEC has treated Coinbase and invited people to come in and talk to them about what they're doing. <laughs> and then they receive notices that you're now being subpoenaed or here's a Wells notice and we're going to come after you. I don't think that's a good faith effort by the government to try to extend a hand here and help. Yeah, everybody's laughed about Gary saying, come on in, let's talk about this stuff. I think it's the SEC has been 
we want to convince you that you should basically register with us and follow everything that we require. And they've, they've played hide the ball in terms of the dividing line between those things which might actually be digital asset commodities and those things which are digital asset securities. They don't want to seed any ground whatsoever other than Bitcoin. And I think this is where you have to get to the point of saying, can this industry, can the innovation that's here end up being a good thing for the United States and for the economy? And I think it can. I think that it's going to require that the industry be willing to be regulated in a fashion that's, I guess, not as lightly as they would like. But there also needs to be this clear dividing line put together. And I've suggested you take a look at the buyer bill. There should be separate statutory definitions, just like it was done in Dodd-Frank for swaps and security-based swaps. And then there should be a joint rulemaking between the SEC and the CFTC for the top 25 digital assets by market cap and by average daily trading volume. Now, Matt, I've looked at this. If you did that, and the SEC and the CFTC had to do a public rulemaking on this, you would be covering 90% of the market cap in the industry and well over 90% of the average daily trading volume in the market. Now, it doesn't cover all 23,600 tokens, and it doesn't get into NFTs, but it would be a better start, and people would know what the rules of the road are. Am I a security am I, or am I a digital asset commodity? Who, whose rules do I have to follow? It's not appropriate to regulate Coinbase with, what, 50, 60 million customers as an MSB. They should be regulated as an exchange. We all know that MSBs are not the same thing as an exchange. But we need to basically provide clear guidance. I don't think that the digital asset people are going to be all that happy about it. But... I think it's more important to get them inside the tent and move forward than pushing them all offshore. Yeah, agreed. Totally. What sense do you get of where the White House is coming down on this? And are there folks inside the actual administration in the White House that know about this? Are they taking their cues from Gensler at the SEC, the Fed? Like, How, do, how would you characterize that at this point? Yeah, the most recent reports that came out of White House type entities, it was at the, I think it was the Council of Economic Advisors and then the Science and Technology Committee or group are all very, they emphasize the negative on digital assets, the money laundry aspects, the hack problem, which is significant. Quite frankly, that's, those are justified criticisms of the industry, and the industry has not stepped up on it. I think that the White House, and you see this with the way that the banking regulators, you now have the FDIC, the OCC, and the Fed all very negative on the crypto space. What happened with SVB going down, and you've got Signature Bank and others, it's kind of, this all it has to, looks like it's coordinated activity, quite frankly. Yeah, and that's I, what I was hinting at when I was like, and watching it, it seems like some of these folks want to regulate it out of existence. And one way you could do that is to cut off the banking for it. If you can't get dollars into the crypto system and vice versa, that's a great way to kill an industry. Let's put it this way. I think the mistakes have been made on both sides on this thing. Everybody was very excited about this because of the innovation side of it and people in the industry some of the bad people in the industry made all these promises about what the blockchain and digital assets could do when, in fact, they were actually just nothing but snake oil salesmen. This is problematic. So the point would be is like I, th I think you, you have to say that they were scoff laws to a certain extent and, and not really working to figure out what would be the appropriate legislative approach. They just were like, as long as they ignore us and don't take actions, then we're just going to not worry about it. And the answer is basically, it's now, they don't have a whole lot of credibility with a lot of people. And I think they're in the position of needing legislation to 
so that they can actually continue to do these things here in the United States or just go offshore. I mean, it's very clear to me that, in fact, you know, that Gary will continue to do what he's doing over at the SEC because he views this as being the right approach. Until Congress tells him clearly this is not the way to do it, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Which is shocking, really. Yeah. Maybe not the most optimistic note to leave it on, but I think it's a pragmatic and realistic note. And Pat, I really appreciate all of your wealth of knowledge and your background. And you've been on pretty much every side of this debate on the the official DC side. And now you're getting more involved on the crypto side, which is great for the industry. Just real quick, t- tell us a little bit about McCarty Financial and what you guys are doing as an advisory firm. So I've got a consulting firm and I basically do pretty complex digital asset and swaps related issues and talking to people about a lot of things related to digital assets and crypto. I've been working with CoinRegTech on basically helping establish reporting company, which will help people report their trades to not only the SEC, but also the CFTC if in fact things move forward. So it's like it for exchanges and brokers. I'm also talking with some people about who want to start up platforms and they're looking at particular approaches that they could do it, mostly with respect to either doing a CEF, swap execution facility, or a DCM, a designated contract market. I haven't done any SEC related licensing things because that's not really my, my strong suit on that. But we do take care of a lot of regulatory things, and I've been talking with quite a few people on the Hill about where things are going on, not only stablecoin legislation, but also the broader market structure. And there's an interest in doing something, but it's unfortunately, there's not, it doesn't seem like a lot of people have progressed approaches that would actually be acceptable to both the regulators as well as to the industry which is unfortunate at the moment. Yeah, certainly a lot more work to be done here. I think everyone can agree on that. And yeah, again, Pat, thank you so much. I'd love to have you back on in a while just to keep up with this stuff. It's it's definitely moving and it's def- definitely something that we all should be keeping an eye on. But thank you so much again for all your expertise and sharing your stories with us. <laughs> thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Take care. That's it for this episode. Thanks for joining us, and don't forget to rate and follow this show on Apple, Spotify, and Amazon Music. Decent People is a production of Decentral Media. It is produced by Matt Bogart, with music by Brian Duncan and Kareem Imes.